my tech case. And our job is to find the evidence and help people discover the fingerprints. <laughs> Our job is to help people see what's right in front of them. What they cannot see. God at work in their lives and the world around them. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Again, welcome everyone to Open Arms Community Church. If you haven't already, you can open up your program to the outline of today's discussion. When I say the word Sherlock Holmes, what is it that comes to mind? Sherlock Holmes? <laughs> Trick question, right? No, we think of this brilliant detective, right? And his sidekick Watson, right? We think of this guy who has this amazing brilliant ability to walk into situations and to see what everybody else is looking at, but see what they don't see, right? And as this detective, to bring into the light or bear witness to the truth that is staring people right in the face, but they're blind to it, right? And you know, what we saw in the scripture last week as we started off this series is that Jesus has called every one of us to be a kingdom forensic field agent, right? So whether you like Sherlock Holmes or whether you're into bones or maybe CSI or NCIS or whatever other letters you can string together that's detective in nature, we're all called as Christians to be this light. These men and women, boys and girls that walk into situations and where everybody else is looking around and just seeing what you normally see, we have eyes, kingdom eyes, that enable us to see what they're not seeing. We shine a light so that those things that are hidden from them come into visibility and, uh, and they start to understand that God is very real and he is very much at work in their life and in their world. This is a challenge for us. This can be a struggle. And that's why we're doing this series, to help equip us, right? To understand our role and our function as a light in the world, as a witness for Jesus. What is it and how do we do it and do it well? Because all too often, if we're honest, the church has not done this well. And we have turned being a witness or telling people about Jesus into something that is actually quite ugly and turns people off of Jesus more than it turns people on, right? So every one of us has this call, this responsibility. Note with me in Mark chapter 16, this is the great commission in Mark 16. It says, Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all. Circle the word go Guess what that means? It means go. And he doesn't say go to church. He says go into all the world and what? Preach, not give a sermon. The word preach means to proclaim or tell, remember? So go into all the world and tell the gospel, the good news. And then again in Mark 28, which is the other uh, great commission that we see in scripture. Um, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. And again, what is Jesus saying? Go. And most people think that as Christians, that means go to church, but that's not what he said. Don't get me wrong. Being plugged in to a family of faith is very important. And we're going to talk about that today, actually. But Jesus said that your main purpose for being on planet Earth as a follower of Jesus is not to go to the holy clubhouse, join hands, and sing Kumbaya, my Lord, and chase after warm fuzzies. No. The reason we are here is to continue the work that he started, which is what? To help people. Come out 
of the kingdom of darkness and come into the kingdom of light. It's to help people get off of the highway to hell and take the exit ramp called Jesus and get on the highway to heaven. Right? Here's the interesting thing. Let me just share with you a few stats. So Jesus tells us to go and to tell. Go and make disciples. And yet, research tells us that an average of, it takes an average of 86 church members to reach one person for Jesus. Is that crazy? It'll take 86 people to lead one. You want to know what's even crazier? Over 90% of our active church members will never share their faith. Now, these statistics are national. They're not isolated to open arms. Open arms actually is a little better. However, not good enough unless it's 100% obedience. Right? Over 90% of active church members in our nation will never share their faith. That means you have the vaccine and won't give it away. And so they will remain diseased and die from it. 89% of unchurched people said they would listen to what someone believes about Christianity. And 90% say they believe in prayer. So the majority of the people out there, when it comes to the topic of spirituality and faith, they are not quite as resistant as we might feel. The biggest obstacle of awkwardness is our own pride. We need to breach that conversation. We talk about sports, weather, Music, television shows and movies and books and business and money, politics. But what about Jesus? Only 21% of active members will invite someone to church in a given year. Two out of ten. More than 80% of the unchurched in this survey said they would attend if they were sincerely invited, sincerely invited. Not just, hey, you should go to church, man. But hey, our church is doing this series called Recovery, starting on Palm Sunday. By the way, this is true. (laughs) And it is, you know, it might be something that you would find of value for your relationship or maybe that addiction you're battling would you like to come with me sixty one percent said they would study the bible if asked we'll ask them to come over and eat dinner we'll ask them to come over and watch a movie or play cards or throw horseshoes but will we ask them to come over and Study the Bible. Six out of ten said they would do it. Forty-six percent said they would attend a small group. So when we have small groups, oftentimes we're thinking, who are our pals that we can invite in? But we ought to be thinking, who in my workplace or my neighborhood could use this? Right? Because four out of ten, almost 50 percent, said they would come. Now, get this. Of the unchurched who became Christians, 70 to 80% came because they were invited by who? Relatives and friends. Between 70 and 80%. So seven or eight out of 10 people come to church and come to faith Because a family member or a friend invited them. Do you want to know how much influence the pastor has? Between 8 and 12%. (laughs) 
And yet, when we think of how our friend really needs Jesus, our mind initially goes to, boy, I wish Pastor Mike or Pastor Chris could talk to this guy, right? And really, you want to know who God wants to use? You. Because they know you. And they know your story, and they're watching, and they're seeing the change, and they need to know. They need to connect the change in your life to the Jesus in your life. Are you tracking with this so far? Let me share with you one more very, very interesting thing. When an unchurched person comes to church for the very first time, so hello, first-time guest, right? If they are visited... Within 36 hours, so by Monday evening, right, after church, there is an 85% return rate. So let's just say, conservatively, 8 out of 10 would come back a second time. If they are visited within 72 hours, the return rate drops to 60%. So we go from 8 out of 10 to 6 out of 10 would return. Now, these percentages are based on visits from non-pastoral people. That means regular folk, the non-professional Christian, right? Like yourself. Do you know what happens when the visit comes from a pastor? (laughs) <laughs> they don't. Well, some do come back. But the percentages are cut in half. They drop by 50%. Because the people don't want to know if the pastor's friendly and if he really is serious about the faith and if he really finds value in the church family. He's paid to do that. No, they want to know what you think. They want to know if you're friendly. They want to know if you think that this thing is really worth the time and the energy. Is this faith the real deal? And is this church family the real deal? Don't underestimate the power of your life and witness. Because as I just shared with you, it's huge. And in truth, I'm not so much the difference maker when it comes to the kingdom work. It's each of you. It's each of us as Christians. We're the ones that have the biggest influence and the largest impact in advancing the kingdom. So in your outlines, you see where we, not only based upon Scripture and the fact that Jesus tells us all to be a light and go into the world and make disciples and tell people the good news, but based upon statistical facts in your outlines, every Christian is a kingdom forensic field agent. We're all called to go. And we're all called to shine a light and bring into the light what has been hidden in darkness. Make known what has been unknown. Reveal what's been hidden and bear witness to truth. Now, here's the problem in your outlines. An agent cannot show or teach others what they don't see or understand themselves. So, here's our key word today. Prepare. Right? Prepare. When I was a Boy Scout, be prepared, right? Be prepared. When I was in Ishinru Karate, theirs wasn't be prepared. It was expect the unexpected, which is what? Be prepared. In 2 Timothy, God says, preach the word. What did we learn about preach? It means what? Proclaim or tell. Tell the word. Be prepared. Circle it. Now underline this next phrase. In season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage 
with great patience and careful instruction. Be prepared. Again, in 1 Peter chapter 3, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always, circle it, always be prepared, circle prepared, to give an answer, underline the phrase, to give an answer, to everyone who asks you to give the reason, underline the phrase, give the reason, for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Underline that phrase, with gentleness and respect. So in these two texts, friends, here's what we see. Be prepared. We are to take this amazing truth, this amazing good news, this amazing God work on behalf of humanity, seriously. And we are to prepare. And you know, we should understand what that means because we spend our whole lives doing it for other things. We spend, what, 22, 24 years getting educated and prepared to go out and have a marketable skill and build a life based off those skills, right? Some of us even longer than that. We go out and beat our bodies and, and run and practice for hours and hours and hours a week so we can play one game. Right? We prepare. And we take it seriously. And for things that in the end... When it's all said and done and you're lying on that bed and you and that's it. Then what? You're not taking any of that with you. And that day It's coming. And that's not a threat. It's not a scare tactic. We are Christians. So when we think of that day, we can rejoice because we do what God describes as entering into life that is truly life. Isn't it awesome? But there are many who will not. So be prepared. And it says in season and out of season. That means when it's convenient and when it's inconvenient. When it's easy and when it's hard. When you're ready and when you're not ready. When you expect it and when you're not, don't expect it. That's in season and out of season. Be prepared. Always be prepared, it says. And what is it that we're to be prepared with? To tell to tell the word, to give an answer, a reason. I mean, friends, why are you sitting here warming a chair on Sunday morning when you could be sleeping in? Why do we sing songs into the air? I mean, really, like, why do we have religious karaoke? Why do we do this? Is it for a warm fuzzy? Or is it because there really is a God? There really is a God who loves us and who really did intervene for us and do something incredible for us that we couldn't do for ourselves and made a way where there was no way because there's a heaven to gain and a hell to avoid and a better life in this world as well. For us to experience when done his way. I mean, why do we do this, friends? Give an answer. Give a reason. And note in the last part of that first Peter text, we are to do it with gentleness and respect. 
Sadly, many Christians just don't seem to know how to be nice when they communicate God's truth and grace. And it comes across very much like judgment and condemnation and rudeness. How do we prepare to be an agent? Very quickly, there are two main things we need to do. And the first is instruction. This is the academic training. This is the classroom training. What's it look like? Well, prayerful, that means we're talking to God all the time about everything. But prayerful Bible reading and study is the first part. I've given you... Many scriptural references in this particular message in your outline for you to go back and prepare by reading yourself to know what God's word says. Because you can't teach what you don't know. You can't give an answer for something you're clueless on. So what does God's word actually say? Lecrae, the very famous rapper right now, says, The less time you spend with truth, the easier it is to believe lies. So it's time to quit playing with the counterfeits and start handling the real truth, the real money, Jesus and his word. When you read the Bible, I don't know about you, but I know many people, and I myself were, was this way back in the day. When I cracked it open and I started to read it, I didn't understand it. Because when I opened it up, I've heard people talk about, and even we have communicated at times, that this is the manual for life, right? Right? Read the manual, know what it says, follow the instructions. But here's the problem. If you open up God's word, you're going to find something out. It doesn't read like instruction manual. Because it's more than that. It's a narrative. It's God's story. And the story didn't end when you closed the book. It just continued throughout history on into your life. And when you and I read this book, it does have instruction, but more times than not, it plays out those principles and those instructions through the stories of real-life people who engaged a real-life God and real-life people who did it right and who did it wrong. And so more times than not, we open up this Bible and we think, what the heck? Why am I reading about Jacob? Why am I reading about Abraham and this Isaiah guy and Samuel and King Saul? Because this is God's story. From the beginning of creation on up through the death of the last of the 12 apostles, John. And then that story continues. And as you and I read through these sacred writings, which God made sure were written down, most of which are firsthand accounts of people who engaged God, and not privately so that it could be argued whether or not it happened, but much of which happened in a public setting in front of all kinds of people so it was verifiable. When you and I read through this, friends, we're reading the testimony of God engaging people and people engaging God. And there are principles that we can learn from it. There are instructions that are given so that life can be better in this world and ultimately life can be far, far better in the next. But we got to know what it says. What else does instruction look like? So I read my Bible. And if you have questions on how to do that, friends, we've got all kinds of resources today. You can hop online. You can read your Bible on your cell phone. Multiple translations are available. Things that I've spent hundreds and actually thousands and thousands of dollars in accumulating Bibles of various translations on my bookshelf. Now you got them for free in the palm of your hand. 
books that I would spend hundreds of dollars on to interpret the Greek and the Hebrew and stuff like that. Now you just click buttons. Not even buttons, screens. And you got it for free. There are all kinds of Bible reading programs out there. So we read our Bible. The other thing we do is church services. Now, understand that what you and I call a church service is slightly different from back in the day when the Bible was written and the church gathered together. We do it differently. But nonetheless, the gathering of God's people is crucial to our growth. It's vital. In our modern-day Western context, it also would look like small group participation. Here's an opportunity for me to not just sit in a room and have some guy talk at me, but here's an opportunity for me to sit in a more comfortable room with a smaller group of people and have some conversation of what this following Jesus thing really looks like and how we can impact our world for him. Along with this... So go to church, attend small groups. The other thing is Christian community. And when we say Christian community, that does not mean going to church or going to small groups. It means sharing life together. And this is a principle that is taught throughout Scripture. In your outlines, we said you don't grow alone. We need one another. And not only do we not grow alone, but we don't go alone. Even Sherlock had his sidekick, Watson. Even the Lone Ranger had his sidekick, Tonto. So he really wasn't alone. Right? There's strength in numbers. We're smarter. We're stronger together than we are alone. And Jesus understood this, and that's why in Scripture you see that Jesus didn't do it alone. He surrounded himself with 12 disciples. And that number grew, by the way. And not only that, but when he sent them out on mission, he sent them out two by two. And we need one another because if we're... We don't, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. If we're just a little bit observant, we'll recognize that everybody has different giftings. We all have something different and unique to contribute to this story and this work. And people can speak into my life and see things that I'm not seeing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God describes it that one person waters and another person plants. We could also elaborate and say somebody else hoes and breaks up the fallow ground. Somebody else cultivates and nurtures, spreads the poop, right? And somebody else is harvesting, friends, and processing. We all have something unique to contribute, and we can't be the full body of Christ if we're missing something, right? So each one is needed and necessary. And remember what we mentioned in those statistics? It takes how many church people to reach one for Jesus? 86. Yeah, every one of us is needed. So we need to do life together, share life in community. So when I'm going through that sickness or going through the uh, pain and trials of life, I'm not facing those alone. I've got people to help me fix that car or fix that roof or deal with that crisis of a death. And when we celebrate coming together and finding that love of a lifetime or, or having that baby, that new addition to the family, or maybe seeing ourself or our child accomplish something wonderful, we celebrate that not alone, 
with golf claps, but we celebrate it with the family, right? We need that. One more thing, uh, instruction, what's it look like is this, Christian literature. Devotionals, books, magazines, websites, videos, audios. You can have a devotional in a book or you can have one sent. I got one sent to my phone every day. You can have it sent to your email. You can, there are so many options for us to, to find other sources of encouragement and instruction out there. So the first thing that we do to prepare is classroom instru- is instruction, okay? We've got to learn some things. So we need to determine to be a lifelong learner because we're never going to know it all. The second aspect of our development and being prepared is application. And this is the on-the-job training. Because the truth is, is that what you hear in instruction goes in one ear and out the other 80% of the time. In fact, it will be a shock if you remember what I said by the time you make it home. And definitely by this evening. So how do we really learn in a way that sticks with us as we do it? And this is where we as Christians, it means we get out and we put it into practice. We live what God says to do. We do it. We go and share with others. What's it look like? First of all, prayer. We start talking to God. We do it privately, corporately, and publicly. Everywhere we go and everything we do and everything we face, we're asking the big guy, the one who knows it all. Lord, Bless my trip to Walmart today. I take it for granted that I'm going to come back, but you never really do know. And it sounds like a joke, except to those cars that were piled up on 81 the other day. As I was driving home from Springfield, Illinois on Friday, and I saw cars all over the place off the road as we got hit with a storm on the way back. You don't know. And what about the choices you're going to have to make that day? What about the things that are going to pop up that you didn't see coming? God did. Lord, what's the right decision here? Lord, bless my family. Bless my church family. Give me the wisdom and the direction I need here. Help meet this need. Heal this person's body. It looks like prayer, friends. And not just by yourself. The Bible's very clear that we need to be praying together, so it might look like our watchman's prayer service, once-a-month prayer service that we do. It might mean getting involved and praying up here after church with the sick and those that are hurting, or maybe being one of our intercessors, one of our prayers that are praying during this service so that you're actually hearing God and not just Mike talk. Worship. Worship, of course, includes singing songs to Jesus and about Jesus. However, it's more than a song. Worship is living life in a way that pleases and honors God. Therefore, if I'm singing the songs and I think I'm worshiping, but my life doesn't line up with what I'm singing, I'm not worshiping, I'm being a hypocrite. I need to sing the same thing I do. I need to pray the same thing I do. I need to say the same thing I do, and vice versa. So it looks like, putting this into practice, it looks like worship, which means that when I go out and I'm welding, when I go out and I'm fixing, when I go out and I'm selling, when I go out and I'm doing whatever it is that I do in life, when I go out and love on my wife, when I go out and raise my kid, when I go and process my groceries through the the line and say hi to the, the, the clerk, I do it all in a way that pleases and honors God. I give my best. I communicate love and respect and honor, right? That's worship. It looks like learning to be led by the Spirit. 
There are times that God is going to lead you in life and he's going to give you a nudge. Other times he might speak. But it's learning to be led by God because there will be times where I have a choice between A and B. And A is the reasonable and rational answer. And guess what? A is the right answer. But there will be other times where I have a choice between A and B or maybe A, B, and C. And A is reasonable and rational and B is, okay, it's kind of, sort of. And C just seems completely whacked. And yet... God, the author of creation, who knows the end from the beginning, says, don't take A and don't take B. Go C. I mean, really, who knew? In 2003, when my wife and I were interviewing at a church in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, that offered us everything. They told me, they said, you need money to do something? You need equipment? Money's no problem. Get whatever you want. And then I come here. And my friend Andy says, Mike, we can offer you 12 grand a year. Oh, and the little dumpy broken down building next door, we'll paint it and put some carpet in there. And you can live there. And Lancaster calls me and says, Mike, we've prayed. And we believe God's answered. You're the guy. We want to hire you. And then Andy calls and says, Mike, we've prayed. Guess what? You better know how to hear from Jesus for yourself. And by the way, both guys that called me, their name was Andy. <laughs> Andy Bear and Andy Haskins. And Marnie and I had to pray and discern, Lord, where are you leading? And gosh darn it, it always seems he goes the other direction that we're thinking. I mean, you know, Lancaster had an outback. I just knew that was God. All right, so we learning to be led by the Spirit, serving, being the hands and feet of Jesus. And whether that's being an usher or a greeter in your church, teaching the children or the youth, playing on a worship team, or maybe getting involved in this needs meeting network and helping put a heating system in or a roof on somebody's place or moving a single mother who's broke. Or maybe it's coming alongside youth and teaching them a skill that one day they'll be able to use to provide for their family. And more importantly, come to know Jesus. Serving. It looks like giving. This is hard because we work hard for our money, right? So hard for the money. But Jesus teaches us that the real treasure in life isn't what we get, it's what we give. And that for all that we amass and accumulate for ourselves, we'll be judged. It does say that in James chapter 5. Did we hoard or did we invest our temporal treasures for eternal reward? Lastly, it looks like this, sharing or telling. Tell your story. What's God done in your life? How has he moved in your life? How has he moved in the lives of those you know? What have you learned through scripture? How did he move in history? Tell. In 1 John chapter 1, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. And remember Jesus in Matthew 5 last week said, you are the light of the world. God is the light. And now as his followers, he says, you are the light. 
God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us all from sin. From all sin. So no matter what you've done, where you've been, no matter how ugly and twisted and broken and messed up it is, his son purifies us from all sin. Amen? But friends... There's the challenge. We're here, most of us today, because we claim to have fellowship with him. We're Christians. We're followers of Jesus. We go to open arms. Do we? Do we have fellowship with him, or are we walking in darkness? See, there's a proximity principle here. The proximity principle is this. That the closer we are to Jesus, notice it says God is light. The closer we are to Jesus, the brighter we will shine. And here's the other proximity principle. The closer we are to the person living in darkness, the brighter the light will shine in their life. This seems at odds with one another. Am I a friend of God or a friend of the world? But if you're a friend of God, it's not at odds at all. Because where is Jesus? Reaching out to the lost and the broken, friends. And guess what? You and I, if we want to experience Jesus, we've got to be about the business of Jesus. If we want to shine brightly, we've got to walk closely to him. But if we want that light to have any value at all, we need to walk closely with those that need that light. So who are those people that God is causing to cross our path? Who are those people that we're meant to shine the light of Christ into their life? Next week, we're going to talk about how we shine. This week, we're talking about preparing, how to get brighter, okay? Next week, we're going to talk about the practical application of shining and shining well. But tonight, today, let's close with this thought. We are to reflect God and his light in the world. God is the light. I am not. You are not in and of ourselves The only reason we are the light of the world is because we walk closely with him and that proximity principle causes God's light to reflect off of us. But if we drift, if we pull away and we get sucked into the darkness and start playing the field of the kingdom of darkness, then the light of Christ will not shine. And though we claim to have fellowship with him, according to God's word, we are what? Liars. And the truth is not in us. So we want to walk closely with Jesus and then follow his lead on mission where he would take us and cross paths with those who are living in darkness that need to see that great light. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, search our hearts. Father, as we draw near to you in this time, we do so not to walk away feeling guilty, but to be encouraged, to be inspired, to be challenged, and to be equipped to rise up and be the light in the world that you have called us to be. Father, that we may know what we need to know to share what we need to share. That we may do more than just give God and religion lip service, but that we might actually live it in such a way that others can see it, see its value and benefit and effect in us and be drawn to you, Lord. I pray right now that you would be speaking to each one of us and showing us how, how can we be prepared? What are the things that we're doing well at and what are the things we need to do better in? And Father, I pray right now that you would just highlight one or two of those 
things that we just talked about and put it on our hearts to just raise that bar, what's one thing we can start doing tomorrow morning to grow and to be prepared? And Father, as important as it is to be prepared, you said, always be prepared. And in season and out of season to tell and give an answer. So it's very important that in our praying that, God, we ask for eyes and discernment to see those opportunities when they cross our path. God forbid we miss one. Lord, give us your understanding and wisdom so that when we see these opportunities, we respond well. And in all this, may you be glorified. May your kingdom be advanced. May lives be eternally changed. And may we experience the grace and the blessing of God. And we pray this all, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.